A House subcommittee met today to look at how the U.S. is viewed in the Arab world. The panel included Middle East scholars and members of the media. This portion of the hearing is about an hour and a half. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Veterans Affairs, and International Relations, hearing entitled, Are We Listening to the Arab Street?, is called to order. On September 11th, many Americans got their first glimpse of the hostility and resentment harbored by some against our people and our culture. Others have known for decades that a toxic antipathy often dominates the so-called Arab street of Middle East public disclosure. Left unrebutted, anti-American invective invites others to translate animus into deadly action. So the war against terrorism must also be fought with words. Public diplomacy, our efforts to understand, inform, and influence foreign publics plays an indispensable role in arming the soldiers of truth against the forces of fear and hatred. Over the past year, the State Department has increased the reach and frequency of both broadcast and internet information on U.S. policy against terrorism. The new, more aggressive approach seeks to counter anti-American content polluting the global news cycle with a positive message Secretary of State Powell recently described as the right content, right format, right audience, right now. But there are those who believe we came too late to the battle for Arab hearts and minds and continue to lose ground to apparent unsophisticated opponents hiding in caves. Like the stereotypical ugly American tourist, Critics claim we have only upped the volume, shouting the same cultural tone-deaf slogans at an audience that neither understands the language of Western thinking nor trusts the source of the message. Public diplomacy works at the intersection of language, culture, and modern communications media. Translating the subtleties of ideolog ideology and idiom can be a perilous crossing with truth, a potential hit-and-run casualty. To be heard on the Arab street, we must first listen and recognize the social, economic, and political context inhabited by our target audience. Failure to listen to Arabs in Arabic is one element of the intelligence failure that led to September 11th. One significant barrier muting the American message of freedom and hope, with which many Arabs appear inclined to agree, is the perceived disconnect between our words and our actions in the Middle East. Heard through the filter of strong U.S. support for the state of Israel and its people, American statements on Arab security and religious tolerance engender only skepticism and mistrust in many audiences. However simplistic or unjustified that perception is, the reality confronted by U.S. public diplomacy in the region confronted by the U.S. However simplistic or unjustified that perception is, the reality confronted by U.S. public diplomacy in the region, it cannot be ignored. To discuss the effectiveness of efforts to understand and influence perception of the United States in the Arab world, we welcome distinguished witnesses from the State Department, academia, and noted public opinion survey firm, and the media. They bring an, an absolute wealth of knowledge, experience, and insight into this subject. We appreciate their time, and we truly look forward to their testimony. At this time, I'd recognize my colleague, uh, Mr. Allen from Maine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding uh, this hearing. I, I look forward to it. Uh, I want to welcome both uh, of our first two panelists, Ambassador Ross and Harold Patius. Uh, Harold Patius, in particular, is uh, a uh, practicing lawyer of great distinction in Portland, Maine, a longtime friend of mine, and a, a person who has a distinguished career both in the public and private sector. And I'm 
very glad to have you here today. This is a particularly important subject uh, given the nature of the debate in the House and Senate uh, this week because we are considering the most solemn of uh, challenges, whether or not to authorize the sending of our young men and women into harm's way. It is part of that debate has to do with the consequences of what happened, the consequences of an action against Iraq. Uh, it is, in the, in the context of dealing with that issue, it is fundamentally important that we understand the Middle East as thoroughly as, thoroughly as we can. One thing we do understand is that the population, just as in this country, the population in other countries may have a different view at any one time than the leadership, than the, than the government in power at that particular moment. And therefore, it is critically important that our actions be developed with an understanding to the possible reaction of what is sometimes called the Arab street, but uh, that may be too general because the population may react differently in different countries. In this context, public diplomacy, the, the art of trying to understand and influence populations in other countries, not just the, the uh, government in power, uh, becomes critically important. And that's why I think that this uh, hearing is particularly timely. I'm very pleased that the chairman decided to uh, hold it today. And as I said before, I do look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair recognizes the uh, distinguished gentleman, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for conducting this important hearing at this time. Uh, since we are so engaged with the crucial matters involving uh, the Arab states. The terrorist attacks of 9-11 brought Americans to the realization that young men filled with hatred of the United States could, with limited training and guidance, <laughs> become focused instruments of mass terror, willing and able to kill thousands of Americans. Soon thereafter, we grew more aware of another baffling fact, prevailing sentiment in the Arab and Muslim world explained away the attacks in an observed collection of conspiracy theories and viewed them as an inevitable, even justifiable reaction to American hegemony. I, uh, this morning, uh, was at a briefing by the Secretary of Defense, and as we walked through the Pentagon, we saw some of these posters that were displayed in Iraq immediately after the 9-11, indicating uh, that America was being paid a uh, debt that they owed to America. We must act decisively to counter this view of America and close the gap that's widening every day between our nation and the Arab and Muslim world. And it's clear from a number of public opinion surveys conducted across Arab and Muslim countries that there's much resentment and much anger and mistrust toward our nation. Our nation uh, while certainly will not and must not change its policies on the basis of Arab public attitudes, our diplomacy must find a way to better persuade the people of the region to support or at least acquiesce to our policies and understand our policies. Public diplomacy is about taking our message uh, to the Arab street. It doesn't mean altering, though, American policy to make it easier to sell. Yet, in projecting our message toward the region, we must be especially mindful that if the Arab street does not take our message seriously or harbors its deep-seated mistrust of the message that we're attempting to convey, uh, that they will most certainly not receive our message. Accordingly, it's essential that we design our public diplomacy to be especially careful how we convey our messages. This also requires a conclusive and deliberate effort by the governments of the region to officially and publicly repudiate the purveyors of anti-Americanism. Governments who in the past have championed the spread of anti-Americanism as a means to deflect criticism of their own misrule, as is the case in so many of the Arab lands. Mr. Chairman, in no other time has the issue of public diplomacy 
been more important to review. And we thank you for bringing this before us. We thank the witnesses, too, for taking the time and the effort to help us with their knowledge and experience in public diplomacy. And I hope the hearing will provide some insight in how we can better address this problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding these hearings. They're probably one of the most crucial times in our history. I think your statement and Mr. Gilman's statement says it all. I think most conflicts are created because of a failure to communicate. I was a public affairs officer in the Navy for 24 years, and that's what I did for a living. And I sometimes wonder if we do it as well as we should. So your presence here today is very important, very timely. We appreciate you coming, and hopefully we can all walk away from here learning something that will help solve some of the problems we're facing now and maybe avoid other problems that uh, could be created because we don't communicate well. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, at this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, right now in the Middle East, more than 50 percent of the population is under 25, as I'm sure has been discussed here. But unemployment is also over 30 percent. Many are uneducated, and those that have an education often can't find decent work. The result is a population that's disaffected and without hope. It's imperative that we root out terrorism and that we remain vigilant in all ways to defend against it. But I'm afraid that won't be enough. The world has changed, and so our perception of and our attitude towards the rest of the world must also be revised and expanded. We must move forward and dedicate ourselves to changing the hearts and minds of those who have been taught to hate us. Accomplishing this will not be easy. An important component of reversing the tide of hatred and distrust that currently prevails in the Arab world is our public dis diplomacy initiatives. We must continue to support and properly fund international broadcasting programs and realize that such outreach is an integral part of the United States foreign policy planning. International broadcasters have the ability to provide objective and accurate news about America and the world to millions of people living in these disaffected Arab societies. Their work is critical to advancing American interests, but we must also remember that it is crucial to understanding their own world. A free media is the vehicle toward a free society and helps promote regional understanding. For example, a hostile Arab youth equipped with credible information is rest less likely to be armed for battle against a perceived enemy. Mr. Chairman, it's important that we endeavor to liberate the Arab world to promote freedom overseas, that we do not forget to do so at home. We must practice what we preach. We must not suppress divergent opinions, and we must not mistake well-grounded opposition to a unilateral preemptive war for a lack of patriotism. Specifically, as we debate how the administration should proceed with Iraq, we must make sure we have an actual debate. It is imperative that as we reveal ourselves to the Arab world, what we show them is something that is open, democratic, and tolerant of all views. Again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on this matter. Thank the gentleman for his statement. Uh, Mr. Putnam, I understand that you do not have a statement, but would want to recognize, Chair would want to recognize that the Vice Chairman is here as well. And all these members before, uh, before you have been very active on this committee, and I'm, as Chairman, very grateful for uh, their, act, their, their tremendous work uh, that they've done here. And I'd also just want to say that um, we are going to have a number of days of debate, and members of Congress will be voting their conscience on this issue, and there will be very different views expressed. Uh, but I think uh, we will all do ourselves proud in this issue. Uh, at this time, I would like first to um, take care of some business and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I'd ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record without objection so ordered. At this time, we'll recognize the uh, first panel. We have a panel of three. Uh, I will say to all three panels that we are usually fairly generous on the five-minute rule and allow you to roll over another five minutes, but it's not intended to allow you to, to go ten. It's to allow you to go over five. Um, and. Um, it, um, given that we have some academicians, I'm particularly concerned about this issue. Uh, to start, we are in our first panel, we have Ambassador Chris Ross, U.S. Department of State. And we have Harold C. Pacius, Chairman, U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. And we will note for the record, Mr. Pacius, that uh, to Mr. Allen, you were first among equals on this panel. Uh, at this time, if uh, 
you could stand, I will uh, do as we always do and swear you in. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Note for the record that our witnesses have responded in the affirmative and uh, Ambassador, welcome and uh, look forward to your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, it's a great pleasure to be here today to join you in exploring the complex and challenging subject of Arab public opinion, or the Arab street, and how we're engaging the Arab world to build a better understanding of America's politic, policies, priorities, and values. Those of us who practice public diplomacy appreciate the very high interest that members of Congress have shown in public diplomacy, uh, both in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, through a series of hearings and proposed legislation. We also appreciate the attention that the Advisory Commission and various foundations and other private organizations have shown in the development of public diplomacy at this critical time. The term Arab street is misleading on several counts. First, there is not a single Arab street, but many. Whether expressed through angry street demonstrations in Gaza, a disputatious call-in show on an Arab satellite station, or a sober editorial in a pan-Arab newspaper, Arab public opinion is diverse, dynamic, and responsive to shifting circumstances. One overriding issue, however, crosses all boundaries in the Middle East. This is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This fact does not mean that we cannot productively engage Arab publics on other subjects. On the contrary, it's vital that we do so. But it does mean that we, we must always recognize that the Arab-Israeli conflict is the prism through which other issues, including our position on Iraq, are perceived and understood on the Arab street. The Arab street matters, but it is neither omnipotent nor impotent. This point has been a source of confusion. Before the Gulf War, and in the run-up to the military campaign in Afghanistan, there were predictions that massive demonstrations could topple governments friendly to the United States. When they didn't materialize, many concluded that the Arab street carried little political clout. Both views are flawed. Arab governments are skilled at coping with dissent or working to suppress it when it appears threatening. At the same time, Arab leaders recognize that they must be sensitive to public opinion, especially when it embodies deeply held convictions about values such as faith and honor. That said, one of the conundrums of the Arab street is the dynamic of its news media, which are often government controlled and which frequently engage in negative stereotypes, disinformation, and outright demonization of the United States and of Israel. Every American embassy in the region, as I can attest, devotes considerable time to rebuttals of such unfounded accusations and attacks in the media. Such accusations and attacks are all the easier to disseminate now that the information revolution has reached the Middle East. Internet use is growing, and satellite television has become the chief means through which much of the Arab population gets its news, including incessant and often inflammatory images of violence between Palestinians and Israelis. How do we go about accurately gauging public opinion in the Middle East? First, our embassies routinely report on media comment in their host country. We also conduct public opinion research and polling through the Department of State's Office of Research. And we draw upon the findings of such private firms as Gallup, Roper, and Zogby. All of these reports are analyzed and distributed widely throughout the foreign affairs community and among foreign policy decision makers. In engaging the Arab Street, our chief responsibility is to make sure that people understand our policy for what it is not what others say it is. This means engaging in a robust program of policy advocacy 
by making senior officials available for media events at home and abroad, distributing policy statements to Arab opinion leaders, and responding swiftly and decisively to unfounded charges in the Arab media. Recent polls in the Arab world show that suspicion and hostility toward the United States are widespread. They are fed not only by unbalanced media coverage, but also by inflammatory Friday sermons at certain mosques and tendentious educational materials and instruction. But when we look more deeply, we can see that Arabs and Americans share certain fundamental values, among them love of family, faith, education, generosity, and achievement. That's the rationale for our forthcoming Muslim Life in America initiative, which will encompass websites, publications, posters, radio and TV spots, parallel print treatments, speakers, and other exchanges. We believe that this initiative will help counter the myth of America as anti-Muslim and present a truer picture of faith, family, and achievement in the United States. More broadly, we're attempting to reach a larger, more diverse, and younger audience in the Arab world through expanded exchange programs, augmented television programming, a new magazine, a renewed emphasis on English teaching and American studies, and fresh websites. In parallel, the Board of Broadcasting Governors has inaugurated a highly successful radio broadcast, Radio Sawa, that has captured significant audiences. Mr. Chairman, we're engaged with the Arab Street because attitudes matter. Words and images have consequences, and over time, any foreign policy requires the understanding and support of peoples and nations. The Arab Street can be a formidable obstacle to building that support. But through recognition of our common interests and shared values, we believe that the Arab public can become an ally in our common quest for freedom and opportunity. Even if this goal is ambitious, we still want to strengthen our engagement and our dialogue with Arab publics to the point that it becomes possible for us to discuss our policy differences on the basis of our common humanity and values, not on the basis of an enmity that is so strong that it empowers those who would resort to violence and terrorism. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I will be happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Ambassador. I don't usually um, comment on uh, statements before we get into questioning, but I think you got us off uh, on the right foot here, and I think it was a very thoughtful statement that uh, is very helpful for the rest of this dialogue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patius. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think your mic needs to be turned on and pulled a little closer to you. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you very much for asking me to testify. Uh, I have been on the United States Advisory Commission for Public Diplomacy for several years and have been chairman for three years. The commission, uh, as you know, has been around for about 50 years. It is the only entity in the United States government that uh, is exclusively dedicated to uh, public diplomacy. It is a citizen commission, seven members, bipartisan, appointed by the president confirmed by the Senate. And uh, I can tell you, for the years that I've been on the Commission, not much attention has been paid uh, to the Commission or its reports. One or two come out every year. It wasn't very interesting reading to most people before 9-11. So uh, there have been, however, several members of the House and a few members of the Senate that have been very interested in it. And some of them are in this room. And we are grateful uh, for that interest. Uh, since 9-11, of course, there's been enormous interest in public diplomacy, and this has been very, very helpful, because between 19, the end of the Cold War and the, and, and the early 1990s and 9-11, 2001, uh, public diplomacy around the world uh, was reduced in content, reduced in resources, and frankly, uh, when 9-11 occurred, we were in uh, a much worse position to communicate our views to the world than we were 10 years earlier. Uh, recently, uh, Graham Fuller uh, met with the Commission. He's a former vice chairman of the National Intelligence Council at the CIA and an Arabist who lived many years in the Middle East, uh, like uh, my colleague Ambassador Ross, uh, fluent in Arabic and uh, very knowledgeable about the area. Uh, 
When uh, Mr. Fuller came to speak at our hearing, he just returned from a State Department tour of the Gulf states. And he said, I have never felt such an extraordinary gap of separate worlds, hermetically sealed one from the other, that you almost have to go through an airlock to get from one uh, to the other. Uh, that might have been some hyperbole in that statement, but the fact is, after all of these years uh, in the Middle East, uh, he came back very, very concerned, as others have. Now, it's not all bad news. The administration has gotten off to a good start on translating American principles and compassion into the vernacular of uh, Muslim countries. The Secretary of State uh, is making public diplomacy a priority for ambassadors and embassy staff, and I would add that uh, this particular Secretary of State has a better understanding uh, and more of a commitment to public diplomacy than any of the others that I've observed, uh, and that's a major plus. Uh, the Middle East uh, radio network is off to a good start. Arabic language websites, print publications, uh, special uh, citizen and journalistic exchanges with countries in the Middle East have all been established to set the record straight on the United States. But more must be done to engage large numbers of people in these countries. Prior to its consolidation into the State Department, uh, USIA was, uh, as I observed it, fairly agile and tactical. Uh, they could reinvent themselves there, and they did. Uh, it was more, I think the, U the USIA was more like uh, the Marines and the Special Forces than the regular Army. However, the Commission agreed with the decision to move USIA into the State Department because we believed it would make public diplomacy an integral part of foreign policy planning. And we thought that was important. It, frankly, it was often left field. And, uh, <clears throat> but the State Department is a very large and inflexible bureaucracy. And even the simplest matters sometimes require layers of bureaucratic approval. It is a not a, an environment where people uh, act on their own and take any degree of management uh, risk more often than not. So notwithstanding the fact that Secretary Powell is um, one of the strongest managers and leaders the department has had in recent decades, uh, putting public diplomacy planning and programming in the midst of this very bureaucratic apparatus has in fact resulted in some problems. So we think to achieve greater flexibility in our public diplomacy infrastructure, we need to place greater responsibility in the field on the ambassadors, embassy public affairs officers, and foreign service nationals. The State Department needs to give them the leeway to develop and implement country-specific program. It's my impression that all too often we have had a cookie-cutter approach to public diplomacy activities in our missions abroad. To achieve this, the State Department needs to recruit and train the right people. My years of inspecting and evaluating USIA and State Department operations in the public diplomacy field have taught me that we have some good people doing it, a lot of adequate ones, and some people who are just not very good at the business of communications. Two years ago, uh, Mark Grossman told me that the State Department was spending $75,000 a year on recruiting Foreign Service officers. Compare that with what the Department of Defense spends uh, to recruit. That needs to change. I would also like to point out that all of the courses in public diplomacy and communications offered by the Foreign Service Institute, where we train our Foreign Service officers, could be completed in three days. Now, I understand that Under Secretary Beers and uh, Ambassador Ross told me yesterday that that's all changing and that they're working hard on, uh, on the recruiting end and the training end. It does need to change, and uh, they ought to be commended uh, for it. Uh, the Commission has issued a report recently, uh, and we made several recommendations, but I think three are, uh, are probably uh, highlighted more than the others. First is that we fully support the implementation of the White House Office of Global Communications. There's some controversy in some quarters about that, but we think it's important to centralize the message in one place. The press secretary in the White House has uh, traditionally, the press office has traditionally coordinated a lot of the 
domestic information activities in the government, among all the departments, in fact. And the same thing ought to happen with respect to the message that we send abroad. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very supportive of that. Secondly, we believe that uh, the involvement in the private se of the private sector in public diplomacy is very important. As I pointed out, the government's public diplomacy infrastructure is bureaucratic and resistant to change. To effectively communi communicate with foreign populations in the information age, public diplomats need to be flexible and agile. So uh, much uh, more work, I think, needs to be done in working through the private sector and NGOs uh, to meet our, our public diplomacy objectives. Uh, and we agree with Ambassador Ross that uh, Radio Sawoff so far is off to a very good start and is uh, very important in adding that other dimension to public diplomacy. It's always been a long-range process, exchanges, uh, information programs, and so forth. And now we need to reach masses more and more effectively, and Radio Saw is a good first step in doing that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you as well. Um, we, um, we're um, going to start with Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, in January of 2002, the General Accounting Office report foreign languages, human capital approach need to correct staffing and proficiency shortfalls and goes on to point out that five public diplomacy positions in Pakistan were held by employees without a useful level of language proficiency. And I have before me an article from the San Diego Union Tribune of October 7th saying that before the World Trade Center was bombed in 1993, one of the plotters was captured on tape discussing how to make explosives, but he spoke in Arabic and the FBI didn't translate the phone conversation until after the explosion. And lapses uh, highlighted a chronic shortage of linguists, and I'm reading from the article, at linguists and translators in U.S. intelligence agencies. The FBI, CIA, and, and NSA said they made strides toward closing those gaps, but key members of our uh, congressional panel say the problem is still glaring, hampering an agency's ability to monitor and inf infiltrate terrorist groups. What, what do you have to say about those major lapses in the ability of our people in public diplomacy and intelligence not having the ability to know what's going on, on uh, among our Arab uh, people. Mr. Gilman, thank you for that very important question. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I had the pleasure to welcome you in Damascus some yes. years ago. Yes. And at the time, I was working uh, with the Syrian government entirely in Arabic. It is very important, uh, a very important tool. Uh, the lacks that the GAO sites exist, uh, they are due to a number of factors. Uh, in the specific case of public diplomacy, the drastic reduction of resources that occurred uh, over the past 10 years, as cited by Chairman uh, Pacius, uh, resulted in a reduction of recruitment, a reduction of training, not to mention a reduction of programs. Uh, and the number of Arabic speakers uh, at, a, at a fully fluent level dropped dramatically to the point that in September of 2001, when the Department of State began looking for someone to appear as the American face on Arab satellite stations. Uh, they had to look to those of us in retirement, uh, myself included, uh, and I was brought back to do that uh, in those early months. Uh, the Secretary has placed a tremendous emphasis on re uh, renewed recruitment He's given a very significant share of that recruitment to the public diplomacy function. And in order to prepare the new entrants, uh, linguistically, we are encouraging the Foreign Service Institute uh, to beef up 
its language training, as well as its professional training in public diplomacy. Uh, Arabic is a hard language. It takes a good two, three, four years to learn to a level of proficiency that would permit uh, a professional discussion. And one of the obstacles to be overcome is uh, the hesitation of many people to take time out, as it were, from their career to learn such a language. But we are working hard to change that perception. Uh, would our other panelists like to comment on that? Uh, just briefly, uh, Congressman, I went out to Damascus uh, at the time that uh, Chris was ambassador there, and uh, this was, uh, I think, 97 I was there. Um, they were spending, they had a budget allocated by uh, USIA at the time, $675,000 for all public diplomacy activities in Syria. Most of that was used to pay rent for the American Center, which was apart from the, uh, from the MC, had a library, and the salaries of Foreign Service nationals. And uh, I was appalled. At the same time, we were spending a few million for public diplomacy activities in the UK. So there was, we had our priorities, uh, I think, in, in reverse. Have, so, we re have we readjusted those priorities? I would say not completely, but I don't know whether uh, Ambassador Ross would uh, agree with me. Certainly in the aftermath, uh, Mr. Gilman, of September 11th, uh, we have redirected resources uh, to the Arab and Muslim world uh, in a significant way. I would hope so. Uh, now, that same report that I was reading said that intelligence and language experts say it would take years for our government to meet its needs for linguists and translators. Are we doing anything to try to beef that up? Uh, we are recruiting intensively among those who are already studying Arabic uh, at university. That is a start. Uh, we already have uh, a number of people who are completely fluent in Ara Arabic by virtue of their family origins. But this is uh, still far short of the need. And this is a need felt not only by the Department of State, but as you suggested, by other government agencies such as the FBI. Uh, it's a government-wide problem, uh, and we need to pay a lot of attention to it. It would seem to me that this is very basic uh, in our needs. If we're going to do public diplomacy, we at least ought to understand the language and be able to fluently use that language uh, to overcome some of the obstacles out there. And I hope that both of you gentlemen will encourage whoever's in charge of getting linguists and people who are well-versed in the language to move forward. Mr. Ambassador, what is the Shared Value Initiative? And what organizations have partnered with the department to promote that initiative? It almost seems to me that when we did away with the USIA, we were really at fault in taking away some of our basic needs of communicating, and now we're trying to piecemeal putting that together. What are your thoughts, uh, gentlemen? Uh, Mr. Gilman, the shared, shared management, uh, sorry, shared values initiative. Uh, is an effort to build on values that have been identified as common uh, to uh, Americans and to Arabs. Uh, uh, the various polls that have been done demonstrate that uh, love of family, uh, respect for faith, uh, respect for education uh, are all common values. and. Uh, one of the strategies we have uh, adopted to narrow the gap of misunderstanding with the Arab world uh, has been to place a focus on these shared values through a campaign uh, that is uh, to begin in a few weeks after some months of preparation. Uh, it's a campaign that uh, is a multimedia total communication campaign uh, based on TV and radio spots, uh, press placements, speakers, uh, various forms of video conferencing, and the rest to
to try and bring uh, Americans and Arabs closer together uh, and to demonstrate that the United States uh, is not uh, hostile to uh, the Arab and Muslim worlds, but indeed uh, wishes to continue working very closely with them. Which organizations are helping us with that shared value? Uh, we consulted widely within the Muslim American and uh, Arab American communities uh, in proceeding, uh, and one particular uh, Pakistani American uh, came forth and uh, organized a group that is working particularly closely with us. Uh, this uh, group is the Council on Arab and Muslim under uh, American Muslim Understanding, uh, and it will be sending speakers out to the region uh, during this campaign to help reinforce the uh, messages of shared values that I described. Did you want to comment on that, Mr. Pacha? No, I just w w w one brief comment, and and that is that. I think you're right that when we did away with USIA and placed all of this in the Department of State, uh, there were some rough months uh, that occurred after that because th this was not highly valued. At this, this kind of business was not highly valued at the State Department. It was a different mindset. And Frank, I've always thought I'm a, I'm a civilian. I'm not a government employee. I've done this for a number of years. I've always thought that, you, and, and I think you all can identify with this, People who have run for political office and who have tried to reach out to constituents and get them to understand what they're doing and get them to understand their positions, they're well equipped to, to communicate in the way we ought to be communicating with foreign populations. That's the same business. We're trying to get people to understand policies just the way all of you do in your own constituencies. And I think we need to emphasize those kinds of qualities and that kind of experience, frankly, more than we have. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, if you'll bear with me a moment, one more question. What's the role of this new White House Office of Global Communications? I need a short answer. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the White House Office of Global Communication is meant to uh, provide a means of ensuring that uh, the President's priorities uh, in foreign policy are accur accurately uh, reflected in the field of public diplomacy, and the Office of, of Global Communication is also meant to offer opportunities wherein the President's very powerful voice can be used in support of public diplomacy. Uh, so it's a way of linking uh, the highest office in the land with the world of public diplomacy and to help coordinate uh, the work of public diplomacy that is done, in fact, by several agencies. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. I just want to say I, I realized, as you were asking your questions, uh, uh, Chairman Gilman, um, that this may be one of the last hearings that you do thank you. before this committee. And uh, I want to say to you personally, on, on behalf of the other committee members, that you are a model. You are one of the most gracious men that I've ever worked with, one of the most thoughtful. And uh, um, when you asked for more time, I could never say no to you. But <laughs> thank you for not taking advantage well, of it. thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words. You're welcome. You are very loved by the members of the Congress and hopefully by your constituents. Um, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would say that Mr. Gilman is loved by his constituents given the number of times he's been returned to the House. <laughs> so, Mr. Ambassador, uh, the Zogbys in particular, but others also tell us that it's not the American people uh, that are hated or disliked by the Arab community, but it's American policy. And it seems that one way to, uh, to break through that is to engage uh, people in the community, uh, and that means to go on the opportunities that they might have on their television stations or radio stations and participate in them and listen and have a dialogue and, um, and explain what the United States policies are. Have we increased uh, the number of occasions that we take advantage of to do just that? And uh, who are the individuals, if we're having these language problems, are we sending on people with interpreters? Are we 
sending on just the same people over and over again? Are we having any concerted, coordinated effort uh, to engage in that way so that there's at least a feeling of openness and exchange and listening going on? Uh, Mr. Tierney, certainly uh, since September 11th, uh, there has been uh, a, an intensive and coordinated effort to uh, provide senior officials to, for appearances for media events of all kinds with both the electronic and print media in the Arab world. To the extent possible, uh, we have drawn on those who, who master Arabic well enough to uh, make public appearances of that sort. But in many cases, uh, uh, senior officials have, have appeared in English. Unfortunately, the electronic media uh, have a set of uh, rather good interpreters who can carry uh, the message forward in Arabic. Uh, it has been an intensive effort. Uh, and you're right, uh, a lot of policy explication needs to be done. We need to be sure that as people react to our policy, they're reacting to a, the reality of our policy and not somebody else's version of that policy. We need to be sure that people understand the context of our policy, uh, the way it came about, the reasons that it came about. Uh, this is often lacking in, 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 in the shorthand versions of our policies. Uh, and so policy ex explication at all levels of public diplomacy from the Secretary of State down to those working uh, in the field as public affairs officers, information officers, et cetera, policy explication is the number one priority at this point. Thank you. And in following on that thought, Mr. Pachos and, and then Ambassador Ross, you talked, Mr. Pachos, about the need for flexibility uh, in getting our message out or whatever, but it seems to me there's tension between that and making sure that the message we get out is consistent and truly represents the administration's position. And, and that, so you have the bureaucracy on one side trying to make sure that everything's approved all the way up so it is the statement, because we all know, uh, as well-intended as the media is, uh, that sometimes they extrapolate out a message or give it an interpretation that the original speaker may or may not like. But as that passes through different channels, you know, you have more uh, risk, I guess, of it being uh, misinterpreted or misstated. So how do you reconcile that tension between wanting to have some control to make sure that your message actually gets out there and the flexibility that you need in the field to have enough people getting out there with it? Uh, it's a good question, and I can't reconcile it. It's a tension that will always exist, but I do think that uh, we need to take some more risks and we need to make sure that we have in the field uh, ambassadors and professional Foreign Service staff who are good enough to minimize the mistakes and let them carry the ball more uh, instead of having to phone back to Washington uh, on so many issues. So it's a communication no. and a, an education process within your own yep. team and then and letting them have some flexibility on a that. Ambassador Ross is an expert in this. <laughs> <laughs> kick having, the ball been out there, there, having been out there for a number of years, I can say that one of the most uh, effective functions of the Bureau of International Information Programs, uh, which is now in the State Department, is to provide materials to ambassadors and other embassy staff to draw on uh, in explaining and defending American policy. Uh, currently, uh, presidential and, and secretarial speeches, for instance, get translated into all the relevant languages and sent out immediately so that they're available out there for our, our uh, practitioners in the field to draw upon. And that is, that is the basis from which uh, individual spokesmen appearing on the various media abroad uh, work from. Mr. Patius, uh, the recommendations and the advice of your, of your commission before September 11, 2001 and after have has been significantly different or are people just listening more? They have not been significantly different. I uh, point out to people that if you took all of the Commission's reports, this is a bipartisan Commission, if you took all of the Commission's reports between 1988 and the year 2000 and then compared what was recommended there with all of the reports that have been written since 9-11, the Council on Foreign Relations, CSIS, all of the, everybody else that's, that, that, that's commented on this, you wouldn't find anything new. Radio Sawa is new. That's different. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Schrock. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador and Mr. Pacius for your 
opening remarks. Um, I want to. I think Mr. Gilman's line of questioning hit the nail right on the head, and I want to follow through on that a little bit about language proficiency. You know, what I'm not sure I understand what the department is is uh, is doing to meet the Arab language proficiency skills. If the personnel uh, who engage the folks in the Arab world can't speak the language, uh, how can they, how can they be effective? What are we doing to recruit them? Is recruiting a problem? Is it that we're not spending enough money? As Mr. Pace has said. We spend, we have to spend money on our campaigns to communicate with <coughs> constituents. I spent $125,000 a week in my last campaign just on TV. You don't spend half of that trying to recruit people. And I think, what, wh where's the problem? Is it something we're doing wrong here? Is it just something you're doing wrong that you're not requesting us? And how do we, how do we recruit correctly? Because as I said, communications is the, is the name of the game. And how do we, how do we go about doing that? I will attempt to get for the subcommittee a fuller response from, from our Bureau of Human Resources, but my understanding is that the Secretary has placed a great emphasis on uh, a reinvigorating process of recruitment. Uh, and there is a special uh, uh, interest in finding candidates who already have some degree of hard language skills, whether it be Arabic or Chinese or, or uh, another. Um, within the career, uh, there are increasing opportunities for language training. And the picture is perhaps not as bleak as, as, as one might assume. There, there are a great many Foreign Service officers uh, who speak Arabic to the level of being able to conduct a, a, a private business session, a private uh, exchange. It's somewhat different when you get on television. Uh, your, your level of of Arabic has to be a good bit better than that uh, uh, because of the pressures and, and, and the intensity of the intenseness of the of the event uh, in every embassy in the Middle East there are s several officers who do master Arabic in whatever function they have been placed and they are always available to to help the mission as a whole uh, when the use of Arabic uh, is essential as I say the critical shortage is in uh, is at the level of being able to appear on television and to do it uh, fluently. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I, uh, one of the two of the tours of duty I have had, I was required to take Arabic. And it was brutal. I mean, it was the most difficult thing I ever did. So uh, I can certainly understand that. Do you have a comment on that, Mr. Patius? No, I, I would just say that I, I'm delighted that the committee members are focusing on this issue of recruitment and training. And I met with Ambassador Ross and Under Secretary yesterday, and they are as well. So it's, it's critical. One of the um, we always hear that they hate us, they hate us, they hate us, and I and I have never been able to get anybody to answer completely why they hate us, which makes me wonder: are we really, are we really responding to the untruths that we hear on some of the? in some of the Arab media that creates that level of hate that uh, communicating correctly would solve, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why. I, are we, are we yeah. doing as much as we can to present the other side? I think that uh, to ask why do they hate us is, is perhaps to oversimplify the situation. Uh, in the months after September 11th, I took two trips to the Middle East, spoke to uh, an extremely wide variety of individuals uh, ranging uh, from uh, high school students uh, through all the levels into senior government officialdom. And nowhere did I find hate. Uh, I found a lot of anger. I found a lot of uh, mistrust. Uh, I think the proportion of those who actively hate is very small uh, and is most dramatically represented uh, by the likes of Osama bin Laden. But the vast majority of people in the Arab world, uh, in fact, as the polls have shown, admire and respect a great many things about our country. Uh, they admire our educational system, our, our technology, our medical sciences, uh, the opportunity that, that exists in this country. Uh, and by and large, uh, when you, you probe, you get the answer that I don't like some of your policies. Okay. And the issue keeps coming back to policies. 
Of course, that too, uh, from the Arab perspective, is an oversimplification because the policies that they don't like derive from the American people and their elected representatives. Uh, so uh, the attempt to draw a distinction between the American people and American policies is a little bit uh, specious. But that is how uh, virtually every uh, Arab whom I spoke to on these two trips uh, did express uh, his or her feelings. Uh, I admire a great many things about the United States, but there are policies that give me trouble. And in that context, that's where the, our function of policy explication uh, continues to be so important. If, if to the extent the problem is uh, their understanding of policy, we, we are attempting to uh, improve that understanding. Excuse me, Mr. Gilman handed me something. <clears throat> As I asked that question, it was from Zogby that says, in their conclusion, America is not hated. In fact, many things about Americans are viewed favorably. It's only American policy that creates negative attitudes among Arabs and Muslims. If it's, Ameri if it's American policy, that means it happens here in Washington, it happens on Capitol Hill, it happens in this room. That's me. How do we solve that? We need to have people like you tell us how we can solve that, because if we're stepping into the muck and mire of this thing and we don't realize we're doing it, unless we know we're doing it and how we can solve it, then you know, it's my fault. Uh, our I'd like to I'll share it with the other 434 members yeah, as well. Yeah. But some, you know, we've, it's, it's, it's up to us to make sure that our policy isn't task, created that's going to create these problems. Our essential task is to make sure that our policies are clearly understood and that the context for those policies is clearly understood. Uh, once that is done, differences may well continue uh, to exist in as much as as policy positions reflect interests uh, and American policies are American policies. We're not going to change them because uh, somebody finds fault with them somewhere. Uh, they reflect our own reading of, of our own interests. Uh, and we have to live with the fact that in some cases uh, the uh, differences over policy are unbridgeable. The policy be, could, be, could be correct, but the interpretation over there is, is that that what you're is saying? one element. But even when the other side understands our policy completely, okay, they may still disagree. All right. I, I would just like to add that uh, the experts will say that eighty percent of selling something is listening. Salesmen go and they ask questions and they listen. Tell me your, tell me your problems. And uh, I, I am not an expert in the Middle East, as Ambassador Ross is, but I, I know a little bit about human nature. And I think when people perceive that you're not listening, that you're not feeling what they feel, they get very frustrated. And I think that is part of the problem. We cannot communicate with people until they're convinced that we're listening and that we sense oh, what their trouble is. And that's where we've got to get the money to recruit the right people to get that communication skill down pat so we do it correctly. I agree with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. At this time, we can have ambassador to ambassador, Ambassador Watson. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman and the gentlemen who have been speaking. I came in a little late. I didn't hear your statement, but I've been reading it. And some thoughts come to mind, and I'd like to uh, make these statements and then end with a question and then have your comment. Um, in the state of California, and I represent Los Angeles, there has been a movement for decades on English only. That movement gave a very negative message to the people who came over the border. And the first thing that struck me after 9-11, that people really misunderstand us, they hate us, and why? We've never really taken time to understand their culture, their beliefs, and their religions, and to be able to convey to them in their language. One thing I learned living in Japan and taking Japanese, if there's many English phrases that don't even translate. We miss a lot in translation. So we don't send the right messages when we say English only. It's like if you don't speak our language, then don't speak. I think that's one thing. Um, cultural diversity. In the current crisis that we're facing, 
who are the people that you see speaking about you and to you. They're not faces that look like you. Colin Powell was the only one, and he got pushed to the margin. So the people who are sending the messages over TV that I'm sure they monitor uh, second by second are faces that look different than theirs. I understand that through the State Department there was a project, I think Louis Stokes started it several uh, years ago, that went to the historically black colleges and selected uh, high potential students, brought them into the State Department. They learned Farsi and other languages, and they could be very instrumental. So cultural diversity is not displayed well through our media. Um, when we rattle our sab sabers, does that not send a message that we want to go ballistic rather than go diplomatic? You can comment on that. And then how do we educate? Uh, every time I go to a temple in my district and I try to deal with this struggle between the Israels and the Palestinians and say they're innocent people on the other side, uh, I get taken on for that. And I really believe that there are innocent people on the other side who have no idea about American policies and they don't hate us. But the rhetoric is so high about how they do. So how do we educate them? And let me just say that I don't see a clear policy in dealing with the Middle East. Right now, the policy is to go in and strike first and get rid of the bad guys. I don't hear a clear policy. Are we going to do nation building? Are we going to really care about these people after we go in and take the bad guys out? Are we going to try to reach understandings? Are we going to get down to the grassroots? And uh, I don't hear a clear policy. And finally, let me say, is it our alliance with Israel that creates negative impressions? So I have a lot of issues that trouble me in trying to think through a policy for America as one of the members of Congress voting uh, that I'm very troubled. I mean, it's causing some sleepless nights since we're in the process of voting on a resolution now. So if you can comment on these issues I raised and the one question at the end, is it our alliance with Israel? I'd appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Um, this is a culturally diverse country. That's one of its enormous strengths. I'm a Greek American. Uh, I, I enjoy that heritage uh, tremendously, as I'm sure other Americans uh, of other backgrounds enjoy theirs. I think it is, a, it is a, an aspect of our country that uh, we must build on, that we must uh, use to the maximum extent possible in representing ourselves overseas. Uh, the Secretary of State uh, has shown a great deal of interest in this issue. Uh, he would like the a diplomatic service to uh, re reflect all elements of American society uh, to the greatest degree possible, uh, whether uh, uh, that uh, be uh, on any basis you wish, and the issue of language is a very uh, important one uh, there. Um, the Secretary of State is also very conscious of the importance of tone in talking to other people. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Chairman uh, Patius mentioned that uh, Arab populations seem to feel a need that someone is listening, someone is understanding, someone has some empathy for them. This can be conveyed to a certain extent by the tone one uses in speaking, uh, not by some uh, drastic change of policy. Uh, there is a great deal to be said for uh, uh, speaking softly. 
and uh, I personally uh, am of that school. Um, our policy in the Middle East uh, is clearly a policy that seeks uh, to work for the peace and well-being of all peoples there. This is a very difficult time. Uh, the level of violence, counter-violence, terrorism uh, that uh, has existed uh, between Palestinians and Israelis for the last couple of years has made it very difficult to pursue uh, the search for a political settlement. Uh, we remain actively engaged to try and bring the level of violence down and to end the acts of terrorism. Uh, but. Uh, it will take a major effort to rekindle a, the political process that in the end uh, is the only way to achieve any kind of mutually agreed settlement between Palestinians and Israelis. We are very conscious of the fact that on both sides, innocent people are paying a tremendous price for the continuation of the violence and the terrorism. So it is certainly something that we are focused on uh, we do not uh, have a policy of striking first and asking questions later. As you know, uh, the President has taken no decision on uh, how to proceed in, with regard to Iraq. Uh, you have heard his successive speeches on this subject, uh, and I think the administration is, is proceeding in uh, a careful way as it moves forward. If you could address the question I raised about our alliance with Israel, is that predetermining for Arabs the United States position? And if they're anti-Israel, do we suffer from that attitude? I think that uh, the Arab governments regard our special relationship with Israel as a strength because uh, in the work of peace making over the years, we have been able to uh, work with the Israeli government uh, in the process. Uh, I think the, the issue is, is far more uh, our, the degree to which we are seen to be actively involved in the search for peace. And for the time, time being, uh, there being no active political process, we are perceived as being relatively inactive. I think the day that uh, it becomes possible uh, openly to uh, work for a political settlement, uh, the uh, attitudes on the Arab side uh, will uh, be mitigated, and people will, as they have in the past, see our, our special relationship with Israel uh, as an advantage in the work of, uh, of building peace. Thank you. Um, <coughs> recognize the Vice Chairman of the Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador and Mr. Pashas. Uh, Please correct me if I misunderstood you, but I believe that you just said that our special relationship with Israel is largely viewed as an advantage or will be viewed as an advantage. Is that what you just said? The Arab governments in general recognize that uh, in any peace settlement, uh, Israel must participate. And they recognize that our special relationship with Israel uh, enables us to play a very important mediating role. Okay, I just wanted to point out that according to the Zogby poll, the rejection of America's pro-Israel tilt is nearly unanimous. Asked whether they approved the U.S. government policy towards the Palestinians, just 1 percent of Kuwaitis, 2 percent of Lebanese, 3 percent of Egyptians and Iranians, and 5 percent of Saudis and Indonesians say yes. And if According to your previous testimony, uh, our policy 
in the Middle East towards Arabs uh, is, even when, as you put it, people thoroughly understand how we arrived at that decision, they still disagree. We have a tall order in communicating as I see our policy towards Israel not, not changing any time in the near future and our support being unflinching and steadfast. So, therefore, recognizing the, the unflinching support of the United States toward Israel and the unflinching opposition of the Arab world towards our position, could, could you please uh, elaborate on how we're going to overcome that obstacle? Uh, in the seven years that I was ambassador to Syria, we worked very hard with all the Arab parties to uh, achieve a comprehensive peace. In that peacemaking context, uh, the, the Syrian government, with which I was working very closely at the time, uh, which, and which is by no means a, a, an easy partner, um, the Syrian government made a distinction between a special relationship and a tilt. But what about the Syrian people? The people who are the, the targets, the audience of this public diplomatic effort that we're here to discuss today? In the context of peacemaking, as they saw us positively engaged on the road for peace, I did not uh, find a Syrian public opinion that opposed our relationship with Israel. Uh, our problem today is that there, there is no active uh, search for peace in the way that we knew it uh, in the 10 years following Madrid. And when that is absent, then uh, attitudes tend to harden, uh, uh, tend to go in many different directions. Let, let me just continue, if I may. I, I hate to cut you off, but we, we only get five minutes. And uh, I just want to move, move on to another question. In a, in a study that the United Nations did, the Arab Human Development Report of July of this year, uh, the report written by Arabs for Arabs points out these statistics. Arab societies and their current 280 million people are being crippled by a lack of political freedom, the repression of women, and isolation from the world of ideas. 65 million adult Arabs, or 23 percent of the population, are illiterate. Two-thirds of them are women. In the, in, in the next eight years, its population will go from 280 million to 450 million. 20% of those people live, live on less than $2 per day, and 40% of them are under 14. Well, in a nation like the United States, where the largest childhood nutrition problem is obesity, do you think that there might be something deeper than, than the, the progress of the Arab peace process in their resentment or their envy of the United States as the world's last economic, cultural, diplomatic, and military hegemon, for lack of a better term. Historically, there hasn't been that kind of societal uh, envy or, 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 or resentment. I think as the figures grow in the categories that you mentioned, that is very possibly going to emerge as yet another element in this equation. Uh, Arab society, as, as I've experienced it, uh, does have safety nets that continue to work, uh, the extended family being one of them. Uh, so the, uh, $2 a day for a family of, of 10 is different from uh, $2 a day for, for a single individual. Um, it is a worrisome picture, and, and the, the statistics that, that you cite uh, demonstrate the magnitude of the problem. Within our limited resources, we are trying to do something uh, to uh, correct uh, some of these phenomena, but in the end, it's going to take a very uh, enormous effort on the part of many, many parties to <coughs> deal with the kinds of, uh, of uh, situations that you're describing. The report further points out that Arab intellectuals are fleeing a stifling and repressive political and social environment, and half of Arab women are unable to read or write, and their mortality rate is double that of Latin America and quadruple that of East Asia. How are we communicating and how are we fashioning a message when half of the population is illiterate? If you're a woman, you have no economic opportunity and perhaps are unable to read or comprehend the messages that we are broadcasting or transmitting. Furthermore, 
as Mr. Sh as the gentleman from Virginia pointed out, in terms of resources, he spent $125,000 a week to communicate to one 435th of this country. We're dealing with an entire region, and as you pointed out in your testimony, there are many Arab streets. So how many different messages are we communicating? On the issue of illiteracy, uh, <clears throat> the fact that it is as widespread as, as uh, the report indicates uh, has heightened uh, our determination to make uh, increased use of the electronic media, par particularly television and to some extent radio, Radio Sawa being our, our principal uh, tool in that regard. Uh, radio and television reach out to illiterate populations. Um, on the issue of women uh, and their role in society, we have a very active uh, women's program within our limited means in our exchange program. At this point, 48% uh, of our exchange grantees are women. Uh, given the magnitude of the problem, uh, a lot more needs to be done there, but uh, there is an active interest in improving uh, the uh, position of women in society. Um, My question, uh, my third question was whether, as you pointed out, there are many Arab streets. How many different messages do we communicate? Our message has to be a consistent message uh, throughout the region. Uh, the nature of modern media, if uh, for no other reason, dictates that, that this be so. Uh, you can't speak to, to one population saying one thing and another saying another. Uh, however, uh, our embassies on the ground are, are able to uh, fashion this consistent message in uh, terms that are most relevant and most directly uh, uh, meaningful to individual audiences. Uh, but the core message has to remain the same. Well, you know, there, there, both of you have referenced political campaigns. You're talking about enormous enormous sized nations and someone running for governor, much less someone running for president, doesn't run the same commercial in Harlem as they do in South Arkansas or in Kentucky or in Central Florida. You have different methods, different messages for different populations, even within a nation. And when you look at the diversity within these nations, the different religious factions, the tribal elements, there has to be some tremendous diversity to communicate the core message in a variety of different ways. We are putting a, an awful lot of emphasis on younger people through Radio Sawa, the internet, television. In populations where 20% live on less than $2 a day, how many have a TV, a radio, or access to the internet? Uh, radio and television are virtually universal despite the poverty. Uh, and. This is true because families uh, uh, collect among themselves to buy a set. It may serve uh, 5, 10, 15 people. <laughs> Televisions are often placed in cafes and other public places. Uh, radio is omnipresent. The internet, uh, to this date, uh, remains a, a very limited phenomenon, although in some Arab countries it's, it's acquired quite a foothold. But what we note from the figures is that, that it is a growing phenomenon. It is going to penetrate over time. For the moment, however, radio and television are the principal means of communication to the widest possible uh, number. And satellite television uh, is particularly uh, significant. Uh, again, harking back to my days in Damascus, when you climbed up the mountain uh, adjacent to Damascus and looked over the city, which was largely apartment buildings, the entire city was covered in satellite dishes. Every building had five or six or seven on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Recognize myself for uh, my 10 minutes. I, um, I have lots of different emotions. Uh, I just really have enjoyed this panel. I've enjoyed the questions that my colleagues have asked. Uh, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, 
I have ingrained in me the sense that you need to understand cultures. And I'll just quickly say that when I was in Brussels recently, I, I was walking down um, the aisle, uh, down the hallway, and people were coming outside the doors, coming in 90 degree, and running right in front of me and crossing me, making me stop, and looking at me like I was rude. And I, I found myself saying, these are rude people. And um, then w uh, the next day I was driving a car, I was driving in a car, and they were explaining to me the rules when you drive a car in Brussels. And that is that a, a 90 degree ent a person coming in from a side street uh, has the, uh, the right of way and can literally come in front of a car coming down a, a, a straight road. And I thought, well, that explains the connection that I had with people cutting me off. And um, when I knew that, I looked at it differently and realized that to them, I was the rude person. And they, in fact, weren't being rude at all. I just didn't understand that when you walk down and someone comes to your right, even at 90 degrees, you stop and let them go. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about the speaking side, but I, I want to put a little emphasis on the listening side. Um, I'm told that uh, ingrained in me as well is that, not that I always practice it, is that you listen, you learn, you help, and then you lead. You know, and that sense to me is that you then take action. Um, I will also say to you that I have some real biases against the Arab community uh, that I have to deal with, uh, uh, its treatment of women and so on. I can, I can go on. I was, I was touched, Dr. Um, Ambassador Ross, by, by your, your comments about, first off, I agree with you. Uh, there is no one street, and almost a little embarrassed that we called it that, but it was a good title. Uh, it is obviously a very robust society. Um, but um, I, I understand that uh, to the Palestinian world, excuse me, to the Arab world, now speaking as one, uh, we appear in many cases to be immoral, anti-religious, and anti-Muslim. Um, uh, I was impressed by thinking about in Muslim nations that we share certain values of family and faith and, uh, and education and generosity. And it seems to me that when we sort out these problems that we have that we need to focus in on what binds us together and then try to sort out our differences. But one thing I know is going to happen is we're not changing our policy about Israel. If anything, September 11th has made me feel more sym sympathetic towards Israel, a more understanding that there are not good terrorists and bad terrorists, there are terrorists. And, um, and uh, an embarrassment that our country has not stood up to terrorism um, when I was in Turkey, uh, meeting with them about the, those in the Kurdish community that have, uh, have been very active in, in terrorism. And that in their complaint to us was that in France, the terrorist organization in Paris has their headquarters. And yet they've lost 30,000 people. Um, I have to start with this premise that certain policies simply aren't going to change. Uh, and I start with the premise that, um, that our failure to stand up to terrorism has also uh, had an imprint on the Muslim world. And I would like either of you to tell me if I'm wrong in my general belief. That the, um, am I wrong in my general belief that allowing our embassy employees to be held hostage for 444 days was an absolute outrage. And that the Muslim world began to look, and I say Muslim world collectively, uh, at a great nation uh, not willing to protect its diplomats and not willing to speak out for them and not willing to treat this as what it was, a terrorist act or certainly an act of war. I go down from Germany, our failure to respond to uh, the killings of our soldiers in Germany by terrorists, uh, the Hezbollah and what they did in, uh, to our Marines in the barracks in, in Beirut, and the, the fact that no one was held accountable. No one basically in leadership was held accountable for the bombings in Saudi Arabia. And no one really was held accountable for the bombings of our embassies in South Africa. Uh, no one was held accountable for coal. Uh, what happened uh, with the cold? No one. 
And when the president said at one event I attended, he said, I was wondering, I keep thinking, what were the terrorists thinking? And then the thought, they probably thought we were going to sue them. And we smiled. But, you know, so I guess what I want to say is there are lots of ways we send messages. And I want you to speak to the concept of our failure to address terrorism um, and what message that sent. And I'd like to ask both of you. I think uh, you're absolutely right on the issue of terrorism. Uh, historically, it's proven a rather difficult uh, phenomenon to counter and to combat. Uh, but I think uh, the current approach of, of uh, seeking out terrorists wherever they may be uh, and dealing with them appropriately is is the right posture. Uh, the Tehran uh, hostage crisis was a very sad chapter in our presence in the region. Uh, I myself was present uh, in the embassy, and I was assigned to the embassy in Beirut the day it was bombed uh, and lost many friends there. I know the costs of terrorism, and I think a firm response uh, is fully justified. But I'm talking more than justify. What message does it send to, the, to, to that part of the world when a great nation like the United States is willing to, t I mean, is, is, did that win us friends? When, when, they, when they saw us fail to respond to the deaths of nearly 300 Marines, did we win friends that way? Did Certainly. we win friends uh, by turning the other cheek? I need to know that. If you tell me we win friends, I want to know how we won friends. No, I don't think that we won friends, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think on the contrary, uh, people began to uh, assume that uh, they could take uh, pot shots of various kinds at the United States and that there would be no reaction or no significant reaction. Uh, and I think, as I say, our, our current posture is, is a much sounder one. One of the things the Israelis say to me is that you are trying to impose your Western thought on our Middle East dispute. And one of the things they have said to me and to others is you will not be able to impose the settlement. We will have to come to grips with this. But I think of something even as what seems as horrific as uh, tearing the, and I'm speaking now of what the Israelis are doing, of literally uh, destroying the homes of the families whose children have been suicide bombers. And to my Western thought, that seems pretty, pretty uh, unusual and um, somewhat questionable until I put it in the perspective of asking myself, why would anyone in the Arab community accept $25,000 for the death of their son uh, who had killed innocent children and innocent adults? And so I have a hard time. And I realize that world is different, very different. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Pachus, uh, would you care to comment on the question I asked? I don't. My uh, colleague, Ambassador Ross, was uh, uh, in the counterterrorism business for a while. So he's an expert. Uh, I'm not. But I, I, I would like to say that uh, your comments about listening are correct. Your comments about combating, combating terrorism are correct. But there's some commonality here. Uh, we're not the only people on the planet that are affected and threatened by terrorism. Most of the countries in the Western world are concerned about terrorism. And terrorism, frankly, is counterproductive for in, in those countries where it's carried out. And they know that. And there's a lot of suffering. So uh, there is a message there. They that terrorism benefits no one. But if we listen, maybe we can get to the roots of this. There is the feeling that if you don't have tanks and jet aircraft, like the United States and its allies have, that you don't have anything but human bodies. And, and I think we have to get to the bottom of that and listen and then respond. Unless we hear them, we have no message to give them that's meaningful. Let me just uh, take a quote that you said. To put it bluntly, uh, 
Mr. Patius, this is your comments. I'm sorry. To put it bluntly, we should not be in the business of getting people to love us. We will never win the war of words. We should, however, try to help understand, help the world understand us. And I'd like you to elaborate on that. Well, uh, I wish Congresswoman Watson were here because I would respond to what she said. We are a very diverse country, and we are the freest country and the most diverse country in the history of this planet. And uh, people do know that. And they know that, and we need to put our policies in context. It is the result not of a few people gathering in a room and saying, okay, let's uh, support Israel and here's why. It is representative of what our country is all about. These policies evolve, and uh, they're, sure, there are interest groups, there are different constituencies, and our policy is reconciled and it becomes a policy for our country. We need people to understand that. If people, if policy is made differently in most Middle Eastern countries. It is made differently. And so we have to, we have to explain our policies in context that this is the result of what happens in a very free society with a lot of diversity. And th this policy is the product, and if you, un you may not agree with it, you will never agree with it, but understand what motivates it and how it comes about. Thank you, I know we have to vote. I, um, I think we are going to have three votes, so I might suggest to the witnesses that they may want to um, um, get something to eat and we would uh, go to the next panel and we probably will be coming back around 10 after 12. I, I think that's probably when it's going to be. Um, I, I will say to you one more comment. When I was in Jordan speaking to a leader in Jordan, he was saying, you Americans don't understand how our community views a leader. When times are bad in the United States, they blame you as a leader. When times are bad, uh, and when we're in a crisis in our own country, we turn to our leaders. And he was trying to explain to me how, in an ironic sort of way, uh, the, the incredible suffering that was being visited upon the Iraqis, where, you, where I would think it would make people turn against Saddam, it made them turn towards him. Uh, in our country, we would have been out of office like that. Um, well, obviously, we have a different system of government, but that's another factor. Appreciate both of you. I'd like to ask if you have anything that you want to put on the record. Maybe you felt needed to be put on the record. For instance, um, Mr. Petras, you wanted to comment to Ms. Watson. I didn't know you were so um, shy that you wouldn't have just jumped in. So <laughs> assuming that you are shyer than Ambassador Ross, is there anything you want to put on the record that needs to be put on the record? Thank you. All set? I, I, I think we're all set. I just I disagreed with the fact that we don't, uh, that people don't know uh, that we're diverse, that uh, we're, we're, clearly they know we're diverse. And people around the world, you know, there's the old saying, go home American and take me with you. And uh, I, think th I think she's wrong on that. Okay, well, I'm happy you put that on the record. Ambassador, any last comment? Just again, to express appreciation for the interest that the Congress has shown in public diplomacy and the support that it's provided. Well, you, you see an interest. Uh, we know this battle against terrorism is both social, political, economic, as well as military. Uh, I don't think that's as evident to the American people that we in government know that. Uh, I think it will become more and more evident, and your work is very valuable. Um, it's underutilized, or both of your work is underutilized, and uh, I hope uh, your work becomes more prominent. Thank, Thank you, you both you. very much. You were excellent witnesses. We are adjourning. I, we are recessing, excuse me. Don't put adjourn down there, or I'll be dead here. <laughs> uh, we are recessing, and uh, uh, we may we may be back by 12, but uh, it may be 10 after. We got an update on several Senate races from around the country this morning on Washington Journal.
as we talked with Vaughn Ververs, editor of the political website, The Hotline. We take our visit to the hotline today for some political news, and Vaughn Ververs is there. Good morning, Vaughn. Good morning, Connie. How are you? Great. Good. Well, you know, uh, 